Today we are going to find out if my Trifox X10 frame is a total dud or a diamond in the rough by cutting it in half. Now Rob from Carbon Bike Repair UK is going to help me slice and dice this thing to see what's really going on inside. Who knows, maybe we'll discover that this cheap Chinese carbon frame is actually worth more than I originally thought. Or maybe we'll find out it's a pile of junk and it's better as an ornament on my wall. So let's fire up the grinder and get to work. Rob will give us his final verdict at the end of this video, so do stay tuned. We move to the carbon repair section of the building. The tools Rob has made cutting through the frame like a knife through butter basically. I'm feeling pretty sad about cutting my Trifox X10 frame in half. I've grown so attached to it in the short time that we've been together. Seeing all the weaves, the shapes, the lines. It just breaks my heart. But I'll get over it. After all, I've come this far. Let's see if it was worth all the tears. So the white part is the top of the tube, right? The white part is the top. You tell me. Oh, is, is that pretty uniform? It's uniform. Bikes that are looking at are performance advantages, yeah? There's no reason why the top lid of your top tube needs to be fat. That they put less on the top yeah. than on the bottom. The other disadvantage is it makes the top tube a little bit more vulnerable to clamping and so on, but it's a performance bike. Yeah. This is what you can expect from a cheap bike. One good thing, I will say, is that this wall thickness is pretty damn good. It's pretty thick. No, it's thin. Oh. No one knows what it means. It's thin. Yeah, it's actually very good. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the construction of the material. Let's find the wall thickness here. See the white streaks? Yeah. That's epoxy. That's the jam in the sandwich. Jam in the sandwich. No, this isn't a reference to a PBJ sandwich for lunch. It's a reference to the relationship between epoxy and carbon fiber. Imagine epoxy, the glue, is the jam between sheets of carbon, which is the bread. Now, when heat and compression are applied inside the mold, um, the resin or the jam and the carbon are forced or compressed together. With high compression, there are fewer pockets of jam because everything has been compressed together better with a higher force. Higher compression requires better tooling and is more expensive. Pressure's low, which which tells me then they haven't used that much carbon in this bike yeah. because the wall thickness is really thin and it's got the box and it's got and it's got jam sandwich blades. that's not to say that other manufacturers don't have these lines yeah. they certainly will you can see again an area that really struggles with compression you can see how that the jam gets thicker is that where the top tube meets the side is it it's the radius here okay yeah. okay it's very hard to get compression there in that corner it's hard it's easier to get it on the flat section as you can see the waviness in this yeah this is also showing you see the inner wall yeah the bladders that they're using in here are not well thought through i don't think okay. we're talking minuscule stuff i mean the fact that this carbon is bonded together is enough to give me confidence that it's not horsehair <laughs> This is pure carbon. And another positive thing about this is you can see what they call uniweave carbon. Different types of carbon fiber in frame construction. Now, there are different types, there are different weaves, there are different amounts of fibers per strand, which is referred to as per toe. Now, Rob educated my naive brain on the types of carbon and how the weave pattern can give each frame unique properties. So see? it's got no weave pattern. They lay it up in different different ways they could fine-tune the structure of the bike by laying one directional carbon in in, in two layers yeah. this way and then cross 45 degrees in a, such a wonderful way on the yeah. bicycle you could get this most, the most amazing properties out of a bike so this is uni weave, it's uni weave okay 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 so that's weave in certain directions which is a locking in material so it locks the construction of the bicycle in this way, that way, and any other way. Okay. okay. You get another one called twirl, which is this one. You can see the difference there. That's 45 degree angles. Yeah. And the twirl 
is designed not for any other purpose but if i flex this if i squeeze this with my finger see it doesn't it just wants to go into a cylindrical shape yeah it doesn't want to conform but this conforms see that yeah yeah they make saddles and things out of that and this is what my cheap carbon frame has the uni weave carbon on the inside and then the twill carbon fiber on the outside which is what gives the frame that lovely carbon fiber effect that lovely finish that they're different metrics they measure them up against they, the one that we find most useful is that we tell the density of the materials per toe. They have three toes here, can you so see So the them? density per toe. Density per toe. It seems to us that from what we've seen and what we've done and what we've experienced is that 3,000 uh, hairs per toe is the most structurally sufficient material. Remember when we talked about the importance of fork construction? If they fail, you'll become best friends with the tarmac. Well, it's time to dive deeper and see what's going on with these forks. Clearly safety is at the heart of this, this build. It's so way thicker, isn't it? Way thicker, significantly thicker. And I've got to say, not bad. This is not bad at all. Quite surprised actually. So here's the thing, right? The manufacturer of this it is is okay. The, the, I think they've taken this these forks quite seriously, which is cool. What's happened here is that flex is not caused by a badly laid up carbon, yes. but by the radius. The radius. As so the radius say. is the issue. Tighter the radius, the more vulnerable the extension from that radius is. Yeah. Is to to flexing. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is the bladder that pushes the air uh, up to the edge of the. So they can form. That's what's left, the remnant of it. So is that solid there? That's solid, yeah. Solid. I don't see any signs of uh, lugging, so this is all molded in one piece. So this has been utilizing maybe an older mold, but typical of the guys who are maybe molding for the big brands, see how they do it, and then integrating some of that stuff into the cheaper ones, which in essence is a good. It's good news. It's a good thing to take on, yeah. For, for the cheaper end of the market, where you, you, you're still getting a lot of the processes and the good stuff. Because I mean, these forks are good. Maybe yeah. the design is, is probably old style. In part one of this two-part series, we discovered the frame was built using an adapted rim brake mold. So this used to, used to be a rim brake, which they've, they've filled in. Okay. okay. So let's take a look at the rim brake section to see if it's weaker or how it's been adapted. They just filled it with carbon. So what you're seeing here is nothing except carbon. There's no hole here. We'll get Rob's final verdict shortly, but let's jump to the future. I figured as his frame was already destroyed and had a section cut out, why not destroy it some more and get an even closer look? Believe it or not, this is the first time I've cut into a frame with an angle grinder. It's, it's not a habit of mine. And it's kind of weird, it's satisfying but not satisfying destroying something at the same time. We can get a closer look at the bottle cage mounts. You can clearly see the carbon shards that are formed around the insert. Looking at the main tubing throughout the frame, it all looked pretty consistent. One thing I was interested in was the imperfection that I found on the down tube when I was inspecting all the paint. Now looking inside the frame, I can't see any issue with the carbon fiber at all. So this must have been a defect during paint and it doesn't appear to have any effect on the carbon. Good news. The bottom bracket was thick carbon and this makes sense as it's a part of the frame under a lot of stress. This metal plate that actually spanned across the bottom bracket was also pretty strong. It's three to four millimeters thick. I'm guessing it adds support and also helps keep the bottom bracket holes aligned. The overall carbon thickness was around four to five mil in most areas of the bottom bracket. You can see the insert for the bolt beneath the bottom bracket here, and you can see it's already started rusting. At first, I thought that this cover was a great idea. No water can get in, right? But actually, this means that no water can get out at the bottom of the frame where water will naturally run to. Then you add a bolt that can rust and maybe it's not the best design. The head tube where the bearings go into the frame had thick carbon as well, which makes sense. The actual bearing seats in places were five mil thick. 
You can clearly see what I mean in the footage, both the top and bottom have extra thickness and lots of carbon there, lots of support. The seat tube has a little more going on. We can see inserts for the front derailleur mount bolts. It's also interesting to see where the seat stays meet the frame. There is plenty of carbon there. I assume this is because it's another high stress area. There is also a thick chunk of carbon around the top of the seat tube, giving extra strength where our athletic bodies apply extra stress to the frame. Damn boy, he thick! The seat post was noticeably thicker all round, especially at the top where the clamping bolts are that grip your seat rails. It's nice to see that they haven't skimped on carbon in areas that it needs it the most. Very impressive. The forks take the win for the thickest carbon throughout the whole frame. And it took me around 15 minutes to actually cut through them. Um, around the bearing race, you can see just how thick it is. Even the steerer tube was thicker than most other parts on the frame. So that's good to see. There was also a big white section inside the forks. I have no idea what this is. It was solid but I assume it's not carbon. Now, let me know in the comments below what you think. Maybe it's a pocket of resin, but I don't know, it doesn't seem so likely. We have given this cheap Chinese carbon frame a high resolution 3D scan. Rob has looked over it with a fine tooth comb and his experience eye. So let's go back to Rob and he can give us his verdict and tell us what he thinks. Now I had originally recorded an outro for this video and overall the frame was looking pretty good. However, after cutting the frame in half, I sent all the footage to Rob to see what he thought and unfortunately he found a pretty big issue. The wall thickness on the front of the crown race was well, not thick enough. Rob confirmed that this white bit within the forks is epoxy that would have escaped under compression. After seeing this, Rob wasn't happy with the carbon thickness of the fork in that section and therefore would not endorse this frame. If you consider that this is a high stress area and if it fails, it's gonna be a very bad day indeed. I can see where Rob is coming from. When we look at other sections of the bike, other areas, we can see that the carbon thickness is thicker than this little section on the crown race on the fork. I'll be honest, this is actually really frustrating to see because personally, I want these frames to be good. I want these cheap Chinese carbon frames to be good. I want us guys and girls to get good high quality frames for a cheaper price. Bear in mind, this is a sample size of one and it doesn't reflect every single Trifox frame that's ever been made. I would also love to cut a Western brand frame in half and make a direct comparison so we can see what's inside one of those frames as well. Um, I don't want this video to be misconstrued and people think that I don't like Chinese carbon frames and that's why I'm cutting one in half um, and I prefer Western brands because that's simply not the case. The reality is Western brand frames are so expensive I can't afford to simply buy one and cut one in half. But what I do hope is that videos like this and other videos on YouTube are going to push the quality of these frames up because the consumer will become more knowledgeable and we all know what we should expect. Personally, I am gonna keep buying cheaper frames direct from Asia or direct from the manufacturer. After all, pretty much all frames are made in China these days, so what's the difference? I am gonna be doing long-term reviews on these frames and putting the frames through their paces out in the real world. So do subscribe if you wanna see those videos. Most of us aren't gonna be able to cut our frames in half, so check out this video where Rob inspects this frame, this exact frame, goes over it in detail with eye and points out some things that he notices and also uses a expensive 40,000 pound scanner to create a 3D scan of this particular frame. Thanks for joining me in this video. Enjoy watching this one.